Today I'm going to talk about some work that I previously did when I was doing my PhD and specifically um, about a method that I um, developed which I, to the best of my knowledge anyway, I think is a new approach to um, help maximise the amount of information um, from a highly stochastic system if you want to, if you're having issues generating repeatable posterior distributions for um, different random seeds. I'm struggling with the next slide. Why is, is that working? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so just a brief outline of um, the presentation I'm going to give today. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the transmission dynamics model um, that I, um, I developed that I was um, working with. I'm going to then show some initial results um, in an epidemic context when I apply the model to the 2015 to 16 Zika outbreak in Colombia. And then I'm going to show the results with this um, new method. Sorry. Sorry, I think what it might be is that this is still... Okay, so this is um, just giving a brief overview of um, um, the transmission dynamics model. Um, that I developed. So um, it's a spatial metapopulation model um, where you sort of take the region or country of interest and split it up into a latitude longitude grid. And then within each patch, you have um, a sort of human population with SEIR dynamics, so susceptible, exposed, infect infectious, and recovered. You also have an adult female um, mosquito population, but just considering the females because the males are non-biting, um, that has SEI dynamics. I've just termed them ULV for ease of notation. And there's also a compartment for immature mosquitoes that encompasses um, the early life cycle stages of, of the mosquito. So that encompasses eggs, larvae and pupae. And I also feed a population and temperature data. Um, so I don't explicitly model human movement um, in the model, um, it's sort of implicitly accounted for through the force of infection term. So that's the rate at which individuals become infectious. Um, and so you kind of have um, um, a component of the force infection um, term um, for when um, i equals j, or rather j equals i, and um, that that encompasses the um, local force infection, but you also have um, um, sort of it's also that the summation is accounting for imported cases from connections with other patches. Um, and so that does apply to both the, the human force infection and the mosquito force infection. Um, the element from the human force of infection is due to um, susceptible individuals being infected in other patches, whereas the um, term in the mosquito force infection is due to infectious individuals visiting that um, host patch. Um, so the model, I'll very briefly go over this, it um, encompasses various um, temperature dependent functions for different parameters. Um, so you then end up with an, um, a reproductive number that's dependent on um, temperature. So we investigated various functional forms. I will have to skip over that for the purposes of today. Another big unknown with a lot of these models is the ratio of adult female mosquitoes to humans. In the model, this was calibrated with um, previous estimates that were generated by colleagues in the department um, for the average um, dengue, annual dengue force infection. And I then was able to use that to generate um, sort of seasonal um, maps of the ratio of adult female mosquitoes to humans. Um, so in the context of the 2015-16 Zika outbreak in Colombia, my overarching research question that I was looking at was, can the temperature dependency of mosquito bio bionomics explain the spatiotemporal dynamics of the 2015 Zika outbreak? Um, so in the model, I account for um, human movement data um, from Mexico as a proxy of interpatch, um, the probability of interpatch visits. Um, a lot of the functional forms were informed by um, previous investigations with dengue, um, apart from the EIP, which is the extrinsic incubation period. So that's the time it takes between when a mosquito becomes infected until they become infectious. Um, for Zika, that's um, much longer at lower temperatures. Um, and then in the model fitting process, I was trying to fit the seeding date and the uh, scaling parameter new that scales the reproductive number. Um, 
So the model fitting process, um, I sort of took a Bayesian approach. I had um, weekly case data over ad admin one units for Columbia. Um, I was sort of a, using a sort of fairly basic brute force type approach where I was just sort of fitting over a discretized grid um, for the seeding date, um, the reproductive number scaling um, parameter and an over dispersion parameter, which I'll talk about in a second. So new scales, the vector to human and human to vector transmission probabilities per byte, that's how it's sort of in, um, incorporated into the model. Um, that's just the expression for the basic reproductive number um, from the model. Um, so when all other parameters co are constant, it's um, proportional to new squared. It also will scale the um, time dependent reproductive number as well. Um, so first thing to point out is the model is highly stochastic. That it's, there's over one and a half thousand patches in the model and depending on the random seeds you're using when um, the infection is seeded in different locations within the country can vary significantly um, depending on your choice of random seeds. Um, so I conduct a set of realizations for every parameter combination J and then I use um, a Dirichlet multinomial, I, I calculate Dirichlet multinomial log likelihoods for every realization for every parameter combination. So I'm going to, rather than using an analogy with balls and urns, I'm going to try and use one with cups of coffee. Um, so if you imagine if you um, have nine cups of coffee that are meant to re represent three departments and sort of three weeks, and if we have, um, say, a group of 50 people who all um, want to drink from these cups of coffee, um, however, they haven't written their names on the cups of coffee, so, um, but we know that all of them have a preference for very milky coffee, so the probability of them selecting a cup of coffee is proportional to the amount of milk in it. Given that one individual drinks from a cup of coffee, they then subsequently add some milk back into the coffee, resulting in that cup of coffee becoming more milky, resulting in future trials or infections becoming more likely for that cup of coffee, um, which is sort of accounting, so that's sort of explained the action of the over dispersion parameter in that that's quite a useful approach in this context because um, infections aren't independent and if you have more infections in one location in space and time, it makes, it increases the probability of other infections occurring there as well. Um, so given um, we have um, N empirical log likelihoods for every parameter combination. Um, my initial approach was, okay, well, let's just um, exponentiate all of them, take the expectation and try and derive um, a likelihood um, distribution over the parameter space. I'm also going to point out, I'm just sort of assuming a flat prior here as well. Um, so these were my initial results, just looking at the joint posterior um, of the seeding date on the y-axis and the reproductive number scaling parameter on the x-axis. Um, first thing to point out, the um, um, colour map is um, on a log scale, so it's actually a very peaked distribution, which is kind of more clear when you look at the marginal distributions because they're plotted on a linear scale. Um, so okay, initial step was okay, let's just run more realisation, so with a thousand, well, it seems like maybe a region of higher density is beginning to form here. However, now we have a mode all the way here. Um, so why is that? That's probably most likely just because we had one individual um, realization that happened to fit the model particularly well, but that's not necessarily representative of any of the other realizations for that same parameter combination. So I then um, tried to sort of d develop an approach to try and maximize the amount of information across all of the realizations that I was um, using for every um, parameter set. Um, so it's a fairly straightforward two-step process. Um, first step is to fit the empirical log likelihoods to some parametric distribution. So what I'm doing is I'm fitting the, um, for every parameter combination J, I have an ensemble of N um, empirical log likelihoods, I'm fitting the negative of them to a log skew normal um, random variable. That's done for every single um, parameter combination. And then given that for a particular um, set of empirical log likelihoods at, um, for parameter set J, if the negative of them can be described by um, the um, random variable um, YJ, 
then the moment I then exploit the moment generator function such that the moment generation function generating function of yj for t equals minus one should yield the expectation of um, the likelihoods. Um, so why a log c normal distribution? Um, because it allows positive negative skewness. This is over just looking at the um, skewness of the overall 3D parameter space. And um, sorry, this is looking at the skewness of the um, empirical log likelihoods over the parameter space. And also because the log skew normal has a support that's defined over the real line. Um, since we're fitting to the negative log likelihoods, um, it ensures the expectations of the likelihoods will be bounded between zero and one. So we're not violating any issues with prob probability. Um, so this is just looking over the parameter space um, for some fits of the um, fitting the um, log skew normal random variables to some of the empirical log likelihood distributions. I'm just going to focus on one so it's clearer. So the solid um, sort of fainter lines are the empirical CDFs and the um, dotted um, darker lines are the um, CDFs of the log skew normals that I've fitted to them. Um, so these were my first set of results, which looked terrible. Um, so I ended up with a posterior distribution that had a very, very tight node down here. So if we then remember with that um, previous example, I looked at when I had a thousand realizations, it appeared like uh, as the number of realizations increased that an area of higher um, density was beginning to form around here. So why don't we inspect what the fitted, uh, what the densities of the fitted distributions looked like in this location in parameter space compared to this one in green. So I've plotted them up here. So we can see that for the um, um, the purple density has a sort of higher central tendency than, than the green density. However, if we look on a log scale, um, we can see that the green density has much fatter tails closer to the origin than the purple distribution. Um, why is that an issue? Because we are fitting a, um, um, a parametric distribution in log likelihood space. So if you then exponentiate that into likelihood space, these kind of tails have a really large influence over the resulting um, distributions in likelihood space, even though the overwhelming majority of da our data is clustered here. There's very little data that's actually informing the shape of these tails. So I then used a sort of normalization procedure where I'm asking, can we shift the empirical distributions toward the origin in a statistically sound way prior to fitting, given that we will want to normalize the resulting um, likelihood distributions anyway? So how about just simply subtracting the maximum empirical log likelihood value? Issue with that, it's a stochastic model that will vary for different random seeds or numbers of runs. Um, so could we perhaps um, try and normalize our empirical um, um, log likelihood? Uh, uh, could we normalize the expectations of the empirical likelihoods so that they sum to one? The issue with that is that if you then have a, decide to use a different um, discretization interval, you'll get a different result. So if we uh, think about the fact that we're, we're simulating our model over some discrete event space, um, which is just a subset of the continuous sample space, and if we just imagine, OK, how about if we just shrunk down our discretization intervals and expanded the bounds to um, encompass the entire sample space? So what we then want to conceptually do is shift our empirical log likelihoods such that the expectation of the transformed likelihoods under this assumption um, will integrate over the probability space to one. And given though that that would be impossible in practice, we have to use a sort of discretized approximation of that. And then that's just representing the same idea over our 3D um, probability space that we're working with. Um, for the sake of time, I think I'm going to have to skip through some of the derivations, but you can basically end up with, um, it's just a linear transformation that you, you um, can apply to all the empirical log likelihoods, um, where the value of C is given um, by this term here. 
and um, the plot's just to, to indicate that effectively what we're doing, we have the um, um, original um, empirical log likelihoods in red over the parameter space, and we are shifting all of them by um, um, the, the same value um, close to the origin. Now we do that prior to actually fitting the parametric distributions. So if we recall, our original um, distributions looked like this for both 300 and 1,000 um, distributions. So after I used that normalization procedure and applied that Parsley approach, I ended up with these joint posteriors for 300 and 1,000 realizations per parameter combination. Um, and if we inspect the marginal posteriors, so this is for the reproductive number scaling parameter. So this was the initial result I got for 300 and 1,000. Applying the approach, we can get far more similar posteriors um, for both of them. And if we do it for the seeding date, um, again, we're getting posteriors that do seem far more reproducible. I should also point out you, you can also do a similar thing with the same number of realizations with different numbers uh, um, with different initial random seeds. Um, so just to give a very quick summary of um, some of the sort of model predictions by the department, I've purposefully just selected a set of realizations from the mode of um, that previous joint posterior, just to give an indication of the level of variability you get for a single parameter combination. Um, and so you can see that for some regions, um, our model was fitting quite well. Um, in other regions, um, we got quite a lot of um, runs where it was taking off at one time point, but at an, you know then subsequently happening at another time point. There are other regions such as up there where similar sort of behavior occurred. That sort of would indicate that the um, sort of temperature profile of that region was potentially favorable for an outbreak at both these periods of time, and it just so happened that it took off at the, the latter stage. However, some regions ended up like this, which could potentially either be explained by a different um, scaling parameter may be better for those particular regions for the um, reproductive number, or it could be um, explained by the fact that we um, have sort of simplified um, uh, human movement um, in the model itself. Um, so in summary, um, the methodology I've presented here um, can be useful to maximize information from a discretized um, grid approximation approach for stochastic systems that are highly sensitive for different random seeds. Um, it's a very highly parallelizable approach because every realization you conduct is independent. Um, an alternative to MCMC approaches where you may have issues with per chain convergence or mixing if you where you have a very highly stochastic system. Although at the moment, obviously, because I'm kind of working over a, a discrete um, um, parameter grid, that will become very computationally in, um, expensive for high dimensional parameter spaces. Um, when applied to the 2015 to 16 secret break in Columbia, the approach aided in identifying um, seeding dates and reproductive number um, temperature profiles that best explained the spatio-temporal dynamics of the outbreak. And um, finally, um, while um, the transmission dynamics model worked well for some departments in Colombia, um, other factors that weren't accounted for by the model, such as an improved character race, improved characterization of human mobility and seeker reintroduction um, may have sort of improved those fits. So finally, just some acknowledgements to my supervisors, Neil Ferguson and Alaria Dorogati at Imperial and Mark Woolhouse at Edinburgh and um, Saviglia is the um, Colombian Public Health Institute. Um, so thank you for all the people on the ground who are actually involved in collect collating all this data. Um, so thank you for listening. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for that uh, talk. Um, yeah. Are there any questions?
It's very cool. Um, I wonder, was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the case data, because the yep. problem for Zika is that it's acute febrile illness, which is quite hard to distinguish from other, uh, like chikungunya and dengue, particularly in 2015, before they knew they were looking for Zika. So I'm wondering like, if you could comment on the completeness of the case reporting. Um, so was, one of the sort of predominant reasons why we focused on Columbia was because it did have the sort of best um, set of data that was available. Um, yeah, there, there, there are, there were concerns that particularly in the earlier stages of the outbreak that a lot of the tests that were being used didn't have great specificity for Zika and there is the sort of potential of misdiagnosis. Um, but was, you know, still hopeful, hopeful that the sort of underlying trends would have still been hopefully captured in the data set that we were working with. So, so you don't, so for example, one of the um, fits you showed to a region had like a, you know, the model predicting a big outbreak and then there was yeah. no data to support that. Is there any possibility there was, you know, an, out, you know, an outbreak of Zika that was just completely missed? Um, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I think there probably genuinely was. Um, going back to this example, um, I, I should highlight you can get the model does generate for some parameter combinations um, a far more peaked outbreak. However, I've decided against showing sort of you can take sort of you know draws sort of predictive draws from that posterior distribution, and you will find some of them do match some regions far better. I purposely just have shown a set of fifty realizations from the mode of that posterior distribution. Yeah, yeah just to try and demonstrate the level of yeah. stochasticity that you have for a single parameter combination. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing, you know, the, the previous, I think it was the previous um, one you showed, it's like that's, you know, the peak is like completely missing from the data, but that could be, that could be real. And it's, I guess, I guess you know, this also question when you're fitting, you're kind of, you're relying on there being zero case counts in that period of time, but actually you just don't know what happened in that period of time because there was no surveillance in place in early, in, in 2015. Yeah. Um, I think it was unlikely that an outbreak would have happened as early as here. Yeah. That was a good six months before. Um, I think there would have been some indications of an outbreak occurring if it had happened then. Um, yeah, I, I think what, what was sort of interesting, it, 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 and the, uh, another key thing to point out is not all of these outbreaks happened in phase across all mm. admin regions. They did sort of break out at different periods. Um, which our sort of model sort of man as I say, the, it, this isn't the best way of necessarily looking at that because I have just picked the mode hmm. from that last distribution. But if you actually look, if you take draws across the whole posterior, you, you do get some fits that are much better. Thank you. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Thanks. Um, it looks uh, just sort of vaguely eyeballing, like there's a bit of a systematic tendency for the data to have sharper, sort of faster exponential growth than the model tends to predict. Um, James mentioned that there was poor awareness of the disease uh, earlier on. I know almost nothing about Zika. Um, is it possible that as the um, disease started spreading, awareness started spreading as well, which means sort of you're, there's actually like uh, increasing um, case ascertainment, which makes the cases rise faster than the disease is actually spreading and the model's not capturing yeah, that. Yeah, the, 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 there's certainly a chance that. I, I think there's, you see that if you look at the Zika data for Brazil, you see that very clearly, um, where it's suddenly sort of, you have nothing and then it suddenly just jumps up because they realise we have a problem here and you can tell when they've um, sort of basically started testing a lot more regularly. Um, the outbreak in Colombia did happen quite a little bit after Brazil, it kind of took off in Brazil first. So I think there was more of an awareness and they were already sort of proactively testing in Colombia um, at the time that the outbreak started there. So certainly in the comparison between Colombia and Brazil, I think this data set would be less susceptible to that, but obviously, it, you know, not totally impossible. Do you have any to the, the Cordoba example you, you flashed up, the model really wants it to be a, like a, a slow, drawn out epidemic and the data is really not supporting that. Do you have an intuition in what's happening there? Yeah, so I, um, 
expect so one big limitation of this model is that it kind of assumes that we are just seeding the, the infection in Columbia at the start and we aren't accounting for multiple reintroductions. Um, we yeah do seed the way we seed in the model we, we assume we don't know the location of um, where it's seeded so every individual that has the same probability of being at someone who seeds the infection, so higher, de more densely populated areas have a higher probability, therefore, of um, initially being seeded. Um, my other suspicion here is that I suspect we're possibly not ca a capturing connectivity with um, Cordoba um, accurately enough. Where sort of it, we're applying a radiation model. Um, um, to, to account for, to sort of describe all human movement across the model. Um, so I think maybe that would potentially be improved with a better representation of um, interpatch connectivity. Um, also, the, the other thing I'm assuming is that um, the reproduction number is being scaled by that, that, that scaling factor that I'm applying to the reproductive number is scaling it across the entire country. You will have locally adapted mosquitoes who, where, and in some regions that therefore you may have a, your sort of R naught and RT temperature profile, you know, maybe scaled up or down. Um, maybe a mental specific random effect on the scaling of RT would help with that more. Yeah. I was just wondering if, so you've developed this new kind of inference procedure, and I confess I didn't understand all the steps, um, but did you try this out on simulated data to assess whether or not it works? Um, we did, yeah, have done it with sort of simulated data from this same data set, so, so generating sim simulated data from these outputs here and then running it again, um, but we haven't tested it with totally different data, yet. so I think that would be, yeah, next step. Any other questions? Okay, I'll I'll jump in with one as well. So not really related to the the inference, um, but going back to how you um, your original model, you break it up, break break up the country into these these patches. Um, I was wondering, sort of, how, how you decided on the patch size. Was that related, maybe, to the environmental data, temperature, and things? And 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 secondly, is is the model kind of sensitive to how big the patches are? Yeah. So um, so it's a temperature-driven model. The reason we did at one point try going um, at a finer scale, the patches are at a quarter of a degree scale. Um, the reason we didn't go any. Um, finer than that in the end is that the temperature data that we were using wasn't um, recorded at, at, at any finer scale than that, so we'd end up just sort of interpolating um, across different patches. Um, so that was, uh, uh, and also when we kind of went to finer scales, it simply became, took a bit too long to run <laughs> as well. So that was the end of the It's just a very quick question about this slide. I was wondering why the plots of the um, ratio of mosquitoes to people look quite similar across the year. I, I guess that maybe they would vary a bit more. But Yeah, so um, Colombia doesn't have a huge amount of seasonality, um, but it still does that there are seasonal patterns. So... Um, for example, if um, we look kind of at this sort of region here in sort of the north um, east of the country, um, it's the density is quite a bit lower compared to say in um, sort of July, August, September. Just doing a comparison here, um, so it is. I predicted we were predicting it would be very yeah, um, somewhat, but not. Um, you know, certainly not by all orders of magnitude. Yeah. 
All right. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank Andrew once again.